and prepare for it next time. So thank you for your, your patience with me. Welcome everybody. Um, I see a lot of familiar faces in the room, a lot of folks who I have probably already trained on using the CSSRS and the Stanley Brown Safety Planning Intervention Tool. So this might be a repeat of information that you have already heard. Um, it might be new for some folks, but if anyone has any questions while I'm talking, please just raise your hand, uh, make a comment in the chat, and please stop me because I want this to be a dynamic training. All right, so let's go to the next slide, please, Dr. Christensen. All right, first I'm gonna give you a little bit of background on the CSSRS, uh, what it is and why we use it. Then I'm gonna to talk to you about the Stanley Brown Safety Planning Intervention Tool. And we, um, depending on if we have any volunteers, we may do a role play. If not, then I will show you a couple of really short videos that give you um, some information about how to apply this. And um, then we'll just summarize it. Okay. So as um, you are probably very well aware, suicide risk assessment, intervention, and safety planning are a vitally important practice of every clinician. It doesn't matter um, if you work in the schools, if you work in a hospital, private practice, or community-based. It is a hallmark of our um, social work tools to know how to assess for suicide risk know what to do to intervene and know how to safety plan with our clients. Um, some basic information about suicide, sorry, not yet. <laughs> um, suicide rates, unfortunately, have increased by about 30% over the past two decades. Um, even though suicides in the U.S. have started to decline from its peak in 2018, unfortunately, it has risen over some of our most vulnerable groups, such as people of color and the LGBTQ community, um, which is a travesty. So we've really got to do a better job of assessing more often, asking the questions more frequently. And so that's why we use the CSSRS. Next slide. Pop quiz. Okay. Please raise your hand, quotes unquote, if you currently assess for suicide risk. So maybe drop a comment in the chat. You could just say, I do, I do, I do, if you currently assess for suicide risk. Great. Look at this. This is so nice. And I am going to randomly call on someone and ask them what suicide risk tool they use. So if I could have Robert Kolb. Robert Kolb, I'm gonna call on you. Can you please tell us what Hi suicide there. risk assessment you are using? Yes, and actually I am trying to find it because I do have it on paper, okay. Now, all we have, this is through Valley Hospice. I think this might be an internal that we use. I don't know where we got it. Um, and all it says at the top is suicide checklist. Okay, that is very helpful to me. Um, okay, so you said it's an internal tool and it says suicide checklist. It's great that you have it right with you while we're doing this training. We're not really training, but um, educational seminar. Yeah. Uh, so as I share information with you, you can look at them side by side and see, um, you know, which tool you really might decide to go with in the future. So thank, thank you. you for that. Um, I'm going to call on maybe a couple more folks. Let's see. Amanda Gageby. I'm sorry if I'm mispronouncing your name. Um, would you mind sharing with us what suicide risk assessment tool you use? Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, my microphone's not been working right lately. So ours is just, you know, a couple of questions that are included in our social services assessment that we ask everyone. So it's an in-house format, nothing that, you know, outside of here. So we just basically ask them about um, overwhelming sadness, 
And then we ask them if they've ever had any self-harming thoughts and then suicidal ideation. Okay. Okay, great. Um, one more person I will ask, how about, everyone's probably like, don't call on me, please don't call on me. And I'm gonna, dee, dee, dee. I'm gonna ask Courtney Pride. Mine is the same. We just ask uh, during our social worker assessment, we'll ask if they, um, about their mental health, and we'll ask if they are suicidal or have any, you know what I mean, thoughts of self-harm or things like that. Okay. Um, Courtney, would you mind sharing what kind of setting you work in, community-based? Um, oh, I work uh, with uh, the CED. I do traumatic brain injury programs. So I work with individuals with traumatic brain injury. Great. Thank you. Um, Next question, I'm gonna ask Kylie McCoy. Of the suicide risk assessment that you're using, how confident do you feel using that tool? Um, I tend to use the Stanley Brown safety thing. Um, that's what we tend to use in my uh, internship that I'm at right now. Um, and I'm fairly confident using it. Um, I use it every day. So um, I think it's a good tool to use. Awesome, she uses it every day, team. That's what I wanna hear everybody say at the end of this hour. That is fabulous. Thank you, Kylie. Um, next question, does anyone not feel confident using their current suicide risk assessment tool? If you don't, just say, I don't feel confident or nope, not me. Okay, it looks like folks feel pretty confident. So that is, that's good so far. Um, how often are you all assessing? So obviously you guys know that I think we should be assessing every day, but I know that's not always the case um, with everybody. So on average, how often are you assessing for suicide risk when you see your clients? Hi, Andrea, each session. Upon triage, okay. Upon intake, only in a crisis. With the Columbia. Okay. Um, on admission, quarterly, and as needed. Okay. All right. Thanks, team. Um, during a crisis. And quarterly. All right. Um, next slide, please, Dr. Christensen. Sorry, let me move my chat box over to the side. Okay, so um, what I'm advocating is that everyone use what's called the Columbia Protocol or the CSSRS. Uh, this was developed by the Columbia Lighthouse Project and it is used in a multitude of healthcare and community settings. It's a really short questionnaire. There are actually a lot of versions. Some of the versions can be longer, but um, the, the basic one is a really short questionnaire that will reveal if someone is at risk of dying by suicide and helps the clinician determine the level of intervention. It is widely considered the gold standard for suicide risk screening. Um, it's been endorsed by the U.S. Centers for Disease Control and Prevention and by the World Health Organization. It is based on years of research, and it is accurate enough for clinical and research settings, and it is simple enough for someone who has zero mental health training. It's currently used by doctors, nurses, EMTs, police officers, teachers, social workers, military personnel, and other people across the United States and many other countries. It's available in many languages. 
The main goal of the Columbia Lighthouse Project is to get the CSSRS into as many hands as possible and to encourage people to use it even in informal settings. So even if in your, your church or your home um, with your t-ball team that you might coach, the goal is to ask, ask whenever there is a, a question of whether someone might be at risk. Um, we want to empower everyone to feel like they, they know what to ask and then they know what to do when the, the person says, yes, I have been thinking about suicide. Um, we really want folks to use, there we go back to the next slide, please. You had the, okay, sorry. <laughs> That's okay. Um, we really want folks to use this tool instead of um, internal questionnaires or internal um, sort of homegrown tools, <clears throat> because this tool has been researched. It is evidence-based. It has been validated. And so you really want something that will stand up um, should there actually be a crisis. And guess what? It's free. <laughs> it's totally free. You can download it right now. Um, I'll get to that in a second. Okay, so how does it work? The person administering it asks a series of questions in very plain and direct language, starting with, have you ever wished you were dead or wished you could go to sleep and not wake up? And then, have you actually had thoughts of killing yourself? If the answer to either is yes, then the person administering it, that would be me, will ask additional questions to gauge the severity and the immediacy of the risk. And then the interviewer, that would be me, is given options for helping the person based on their answers. And I really like that part. And the questions might seem obvious or intuitive. And you might, if you've been in this field for as long as I have, you might feel like, well, I can just wing it. Um, it's better to follow it like you follow a script because their sequence and precise wording have been really fine tuned through intensive study. And that will give you the most reliable evidence supported tool. Any questions so far? Okay, let's go to the next slide. When do we use it? Uh, we train folks to use it routinely all the time. So you don't even have to overthink whether you should ask the person or not. Um, when I train folks, I train them every time you see a client, even if they're a weekly outpatient psychotherapy client. Um, I train my folks to use it even if you're working with a client on anxiety. Let's say you're not even working with them on depression or suicidal ideation. I, um, I don't want folks to feel like they're internally struggling with, should I ask? Should I not ask? Oh, shoot. I wish I had asked. Just ask. And it, it's not going to um, increase the risk of suicidal ideation in your client at all. It's really just going to be um, something that your client starts to expect. Okay, I'm going to see Beth today. I know she's going to ask me about suicidal ideation, and it's it's not even a big deal. Um, sorry, I'm looking at Shannon's question. The CSSRS can be used with folks as young as four years old. That's a really good question. Um, the first two questions, the language changes a little bit. Um, I believe it's, have you ever had thoughts that you, hold on, let me, have you ever thought about how to make yourself not alive anymore? So that's just how the question changes for, for young kiddos. <clears throat> um, okay, so we're gonna use it at every session. Um, intake every time we see the client and there are different versions of the screen. So the first time you see a client, you might be getting a long detailed history. And so you're gonna ask them over their whole lifetime, how many times have they had suicidal ideation? How many times have they um, actually made an attempt? So on and so forth. <clears throat> if you work with folks for a long period of time, then you can use different screeners such as since your last visit with me, have you had any thoughts of suicide? So on and so forth. Um, 
Like I said, people can use it at home or on the job, whenever someone is acting unusually or when you might see them showing signs of depression, or even if you meet a stranger on the street who is obviously in despair, you can use this. Um, when we first started talking about using the CSSRS at WVU Medicine, I know that some of the physicians in the, particularly in the emergency department, were really nervous. And also at BMED, uh, folks were really nervous that this meant we were going to have a huge increase in people visiting the um, emergency department for suicidal ideation. And they were worried that we wouldn't have capacity to treat them. Um, but actually research has shown that's not exactly the case. Going to the hospital is necessary in only about 1% of the instances in which the CSSRS is used. It's more common for folks to be referred to um, outpatient counseling or to the hotline. Any questions? So far, whew. You guys, they just turned the heat on in the office that I'm working in, and I feel like I'm going to die. It's so hot. <laughs> you see, I'm like blushing. Okay, next slide, please. This is also great. Training is not required, and you do not need any mental health experience to use the Columbia Protocol. However, it is helpful. And there are so many training tools out there that you can use as an individual that your organization can adopt. Um, and they're all online and you can do them at your own pace. Um, would you click on the hyperlink, please, if that's available to you? Yay, it worked. Okay, so here is the landing page for the Lighthouse. And um, you can see that it's not required. You don't need any mental health experience, but it's helpful to have training. So um, if we'll scroll down, we have some interactive training modules. There are pre-recorded webinars. You can participate in a live webinar. You can participate in in-person training. And if you really, really want a certificate, because I know we social workers love our certificates, then they can give you a certificate, but it's not even necessary. Okay, thank you. We can X out of that. But that website is <clears throat> a, a treasure trove of information. Um, if you want to use this in any research, then there's a, uh, a particular protocol that you use and a whole other um, department that will guide you in using it for research. Next slide, please. Okay, so here's the most basic version of the Columbia protocol. It is so simple. And I love that um, on the right-hand side, there's a color grid to help you like really zero in on low risk, medium risk, high risk. So what you're gonna do is just gonna ask those questions and you're gonna put yes or no in the yellow, the orange. Have you wished you were dead or wished you could go to sleep and not wake up? If the answer is no, then you skip to question six. Always go to question six if one or two are no. No, I have not. Okay, have you actually had any thoughts about killing yourself? No, I have not. Okay, I'm gonna ask you just one more question. Have you done anything, started to do anything or prepared to do anything to end your life? And why we ask those questions is um, to, to, to make sure that the client completely understands what we are asking and we're being exactly very clear. Uh, back in the day, we might've been trained to ask, have you had any thoughts of harming yourself? That's too vague. Um, so the, the client might be thinking that I'm asking, has she been cutting herself? But I'm thinking about suicide. So when you follow this exactly, there is uh, no room for error. We all know what we're talking about. Um, so let's assume that the client says yes. Okay, then you go down to question number three. Have you been thinking about how you might do this? Let's say they say no. 
Okay, so then that leaves us in the moderate risk. And then let, that lets us know when we go into the intervention planning, we're gonna look at all of the information that's given to us of what to do now. Okay, if the client says, yes, I've been thinking about how I might do this, then you're gonna go down to number four and say, have you had these thoughts and had some intention of acting on them? Yes, I have. Okay, have you started to work out a plan? Yes, I have. Do you have intention to carry out this plan? Yes, I have. Everybody with me so far? And so at this point, you know that the client is a very high risk and that's gonna inform your next steps. And so again, I really like this, um, this tool because all of the information is right there for you. You've got the new suicide and crisis hotline, 988. I hope this is posted everywhere that you work and in all of the schools and all of the churches. Um, and it says, if the answer to four, five, or six is yes, get immediate help. You, as the provider, can call or text 988, or you can call 911 or you can assist that client in getting to the emergency room, but stay with them until they can be evaluated. So what you would want to do is, let's say you're in a, um, an outpatient setting like where I work, I might say, I really recommend that you go um, be evaluated at the emergency department. Is there anyone that you can call that can come meet you here and take you to the emergency room? They might say, nope, I, or I don't want to, then I'm going to stay with them and I'm going to call an ambulance to come and get them so that we can safely transport them. Does anybody have any questions on this so far? Um, I had a quick question, uh, Beth. Yeah. Um, so at that point, um, you know, you said, you know, if they say you don't want to go, you know, you're going to call the ambulance, stuff like that. At what point do you determine that, like, if that's true, that there's a determination that they're not, they don't have the capacity at that point to make that decision? Or do you, like, seek to maintain, you know, their self-determination? Like, how do you balance that in that moment? Oh, that's a really great question. Uh, in following the tool, I, I use that to talk to the client about how high their risk is. And I let them know that when they are entering into treatment with me, they are um, trusting me to look at their risk factors and keep them safe. And I, I might even show them the tool. Um, hold on. There's another one I'm looking for. Okay, so I don't, you don't know if you can see this. So I might even show them the tool and say, you know, all of these things that you've been telling me, all of these behaviors and thoughts and emotions that you have been going through, put you in this risk category. And your risk is so high that I am really worried about your safety. And I think you are in such a crisis that you're not really thinking clearly right now. Um, and you might not be making the best decisions for yourself but I know that you trust me by coming here to see me. So I'm asking if you can take a leap of faith and continue to trust me and this tool, because this tool is telling me that we need to go to the emergency department and, and have that conversation with them. Does that somewhat answer your question? Uh, yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, and you know, this did happen up in my practice at, about six months ago, you know, I had a client who really was like, I don't want to go to the hospital. I, I, I don't feel that that's necessary. And I said, I hear you. I hear that you don't think it's necessary, but it, in my training and my experience, you are really high risk and I, I can't let you just go home. So will you work with me? Excellent question. What was your name? Katrina, I have a question. Oh, hi, Katrina. So what, what happens when the ambulance arrives and they say, nope, I'm not going? Mm. That's a really good question. That's when you might enter into um, some decision making about whether you want to file a petition. Have you ever had to do that before? 
Are you still? Yes, in the past, yeah. Yeah, how did that go for you? It depends on the court. You know, a lot of times um, the court knew me well enough that if I was filing something, they went along with it because they trusted my judgment. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's so hard. It's really so hard. There's not a black and white answer for that, right? Um, you might want to get some supervision in the moment. Like if you have a direct supervisor, hopefully you are keeping them in the loop and you're letting them know I have this client and um, they're high risk for acting on suicidal thoughts. Uh, they don't have a ride to the ED. We're gonna call an ambulance. Can you be close by for standby so I can talk through any, um, any snags that might happen? And let's say the ambulance comes and the client says, nope, you know what? I changed my mind. Okay, you know, you do have every right to go home. Um, you've already documented the high suicide risk in your notes. You've already told your supervisor and then your supervisor and you may decide to um, file a petition or you may not. Does that answer your question? Yes, thank you. Yeah. Does anybody else on the call have some um, in the field experience with this that they want to share? Yeah, I um, I did adult protective services for about two years. Um, I'm actually the adult service trainer for the state now for the DHHR. Um, so I try to share this with everybody, but I've had to to file several uh, mental hygiene petitions um, and involuntary commitment proceedings. And uh, there was one individual in particular that um, he was homeless. And, you know, the biggest issue was like finding him <laughs> and trying to get him in one place for the police to be able to come pick him up. But, um, but it was quite often that getting him help, you know, before there was a determination of him lacking capacity, you know, like the hard part was just getting him to the hospital. <laughs> You know, um, and at that point, it's like when you don't have a medical professional there and you don't have a form that says they can't make that decision. I mean, it stinks. <laughs> it does. And, you know, as social workers, we want to be able to 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 save everyone sometimes. Um, and it just we can't. Mm -hmm. But we can we can fulfill our ethical obligations. We can use every means that we can and you know the system you know like works itself out but it's it's you know being committed to your clients is going to get you the best results you know you're gonna be faithful and you're gonna um you, you know like maintain their self-determination and their constitutional rights when you can mm -hmm. well said thank you so much um Andrea, I see that you raised your hand. I don't know if that was a while ago or if that's recent. That is recent. Okay. Um, and just so, just because I'm, for, I have a fair amount of experience working with patients who are, especially with chronic suicidality. And this is where, when you are doing the screening, this is where rapport is crucial. Because if it is a patient that you have seen for a while and you, you, we learn these people's people's mannerisms inside and out, and when you know that they that they they're they're hitting all the boxes and things like that when it comes to CSSR, and we know that they need to go. Having that rapport is vital in getting them to understand and see, um, because ultimately we want the decision to be theirs. We don't want to file them. And I think when you're in that situation where you're looking and having to do that, being open and honest with them, be like, look, be like, this is not something I, I want to do, but I will do it for your safety. And what I've noticed is, is when I've had that situation happen is typically when I say, look, I, I, my goal is to keep you safe. My goal is to, is to keep you alive. They tend to go, okay. And then they're more willing to go willingly. Mm -hmm. Nice. Thank you, Andrea. Um, I want to address a couple of comments and questions in the chat. Tyra says, 
I'm a middle school counselor in a rural area of West Virginia. Our closest ER with a mental health department is 30 minutes away. Parents have threatened to not pay an ambulance if I call. That sounds really, really, really hard. Oof, Tyra, do you mind unmuting and, and sharing a little bit about how you handle that situation? Can you hear me now? Yes. Okay, cool. Um, when that situation happened, um, the student had scored really high and the parents were adamant that it was all just attention seeking behavior. And um, I am advocating for our county to make it mandatory for um, students who score high on a suicide risk assessment be seen by a mental health provider because I've recently learned it's not mandatory, it's up to the parent. Mm. What county do you live in? Hampshire County, West Virginia. Hampshire County. And so if they score really high risk using this tool, then it's up to the parents to engage them. Yeah, and you would like to make it mandatory in your county? Yes, I'm advocating for that because I just feel like um, students can sway their parents' decision and they can, you know, skirt around the truth so well that the parents might not even realize how dangerous the situation is. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. it's just, it's scary for me because I feel like we, we really walk a fine line and I'm not sure that 100% of our students are getting the help they need. Right, right. It sounds like Carly <clears throat> is having the same experience as well. And I think it goes back to what the, the person who works for DHHR, I'm sorry, I didn't catch your name. I, I forgot your name already. Um, you do the best that you can. You, you assess for the risk you document the risk, you give your recommendations based on your training, your education, your expertise. And um, Amanda Gageby is saying, then make a CPS referral. Thank you, Josh. Um, and at the end of the day, you, you do your very best and you document what you have recommended. Okay, thank you. Yeah, does anybody else who works with kids, um, feel like they have some, some more to share here. I wanna read what Shayla's written. As a parent who has had to go through this, my child wouldn't be where she is now without the quick help from her school's teacher and counselor being so close with the kids. Parents' lack of knowledge is the hard part to get through. Absolutely, thank you, Shayla. It is so tough. I feel like Dr. Christensen, we should have a whole other lunch and learn about suicide risk and children, right? But so, <laughs> I was going to jump in because, you know, I, I love this presentation because this is, as you know, my research area. But um, one thing I just wanted to add in terms of the work with kids, and again, I don't know, this is not something I think that has been done in West Virginia, but I know there have been um, sort of brief family-based interventions that have been tested with kiddos, um, with adolescents anyways, um, that can actually prevent hospital admission um, so that, you know, there's, there's some safety planning and risk assessment that can happen with the parents jointly. Um, it would be great if West Virginia could find a way to provide that without folks having to drive 30 minutes to an ER, because that's a huge barrier. Um, but mm -hmm. Um, I know that they're, um, you know, just doing some brief safety planning, brief interventions right. might be an option too. Anyway, so that's just my my two cents worth. But yeah, absolutely. I think we need something on, on how to do this with kiddos too. Thank you. Um, as you were talking and I was reading, someone said, wondering if you call the 988 line with them or help for West Virginia it reminded me of um, the community-based mental health organizations like Valley and Summit Center have those mo mobile crisis units. And I wonder if those 
teams might be good to call in situations like this. Uh, Katrina just said, I know of parents who have contacted the children's mobile crisis line and it took two days for them to call the family back. Oh, okay. Yikes. Um, can I speak to that? Yes. Beth? Yes. So I know I'm on here and we have a mobile crisis team in the Northern Panhandle. And I know that Diana is on and she's in the Eastern Panhandle. I think we would both agree that that's not the expectation of service that families should expect. And okay. if they don't get the response that they want, they need to let someone at the state know because the response is expected to be within an hour whenever possible. Wow. Wow. So, Thank you for saying that. Hi, Derek. Sure. Uh, yeah. So, you know, I <laughs> am the supervisor for Children's Mobile Crisis in Region 2, which covers eight counties. And I, I can tell you that we answer every phone call. Um, I'm not sure where they're calling. Um, but yeah, and, and you know, children's mobile crisis generally is 24 seven response, uh, but Help for West Virginia is the, um, the pathway. So calling Help for West Virginia would get you to 988, um, uh, would also get you to children's mobile crisis. Um, they answer the phone 24 seven, so I'm not sure where people are calling. Okay, so you're saying that the very first number they should call is help for West Virginia or 988, yes. either or, they're going to get yes. there. Yes. Okay, yes. thank you so because much. Because then it triages to the individual agency that serves whatever county that their caller is from. Perfect. Thank you all. A treasure trove of information and resources. Yeah. It's so helpful that we have each other to network with because you cannot know all the things, right? Mm -hmm. And so when we rely on each other and we network and we share information, then we can um, help our clients more. So thank you all so much. Um, could we advance the next slide? Um, okay, so... Before we go to the Stanley Brown safety planning intervention tool, I'll just summarize really quickly about why I like the Columbia protocol is that it I ask all the time. I don't have to worry about when to ask or not. It tells me exactly what to say and it tells me exactly what those interventions are going to be. I don't feel unsupported um, as a provider in a private practice because I, I feel supported by that tool. Um, once you have identified that a client is at risk, or let's say a client has been hospitalized and they're getting ready to be discharged, hospitalized for a suicide attempt or high risk of suicide attempt, then you're going to use the safety planning intervention tool, which was developed by uh, Stanley M. Brown. So it is a brief intervention to help those experiencing self-harm and suicidal thoughts with a concrete way to mitigate risk and increase safety. That's what it is. Um, it's another handy dandy form. You know, we love our forms as social workers and counselors and therapists. Um, why we use it? We use it because research demonstrates that having written reminders about coping strategies clients can use when they're distressed and who to contact can reduce the risk of suicide. Um, I first wanna say, this is not a no suicide contract. Um, those aren't recommended anymore. Um, if you are still using those at your agency or in your practice, and you're not really sure why we don't use those anymore, then just message me privately after this and we can talk a little bit more about it. Um, so this is not a no suicide contract. This is a let's help you <clears throat> learn how to cope with those feelings so that we can get you through um, the intense period of risk at down to where you're at a lower risk um, of acting on those thoughts. So people at risk for suicide are likely to experience changes in their level of risk over time. Um, acute suicide risk actually 
increases and decreases over a short period of time. So the goal of safety planning is for people to become more aware of their own personal warning signs that a suicidal crisis is beginning or escalating so that they can take positive action before they're in danger of acting on their suicidal feelings. And I'm gonna show you a, a graphic about that curve in just a minute. Um, I also wanna say, when you use the safety planning intervention tool, it is most helpful for you to keep a copy, <clears throat> for your client to take a copy home, and for um, you to tell your client, this is something I want you to share with every member of your treatment team. So if you see me, I'm your therapist, but then you have a psychiatrist at another office, or you have a pediatrician at another office, please make all of the folks in your life aware that you have this plan so that we can all refer back to it whenever we see you. And that way we, we keep supporting the client. Hey, are you using your plan? How is it going? Do we need to edit your plan? Um, so on and so forth. Okay, next slide, please. This is what the Stanley Brown safety plan looks like. Um, it's something that you do collaboratively. So you're not going to be the all-knowing therapist. I know what's best for you. These are your warning signs and these are the coping strategies that I taught you how to use. <clears throat> it's, um, that's not helpful. So what we wanna do is collaborate with the client and help them to verbalize what they know their warning signs to be. Um, my warning signs were I started to withdraw from my family and friends. I lost interest in all of my activities. I stopped taking a shower. Um, I started fighting with my boyfriend or girlfriend. Those might be warning signs. Hmm. Then you collaborate with them on what things they can do within themselves, their internal coping strategies to take their mind off their problems first before contacting another person. And so you really want this person to stretch their ability to use their internal coping strategies. You want to help them develop inner resilience. They might not be able to do it in the beginning. You know, um, it might be a skill that they have to develop over time, but you want them to practice it first. Um, so you ask them what they think might help. Oh, I can journal. I can go for a walk. I can um, do that cool breathing technique that you taught me. I can use those CBT skills that you taught me. Okay, great. So you're going to write those down. Um, and then if that doesn't work, then you're going to have the client reach out to someone um, in a way that will provide them distraction. <clears throat> so it's not, um, this isn't the step where they say, hey, um, best friend, I'm feeling suicidal. Can we talk about it? That comes later. For step three, it's really what can you do that will distract you and get you engaged in, in life, get you um, thinking about what's going on at the mall. Oh, let's go downtown and see the, the art walk for April. Um, let's go to a movie, so on and so forth. If that still doesn't work, then you're gonna contact people in your support system that can help you during this crisis. So you might say, um, I, my best friend will always listen to me. My mom will always listen to me and um, this other person. And you're gonna write down their names and the phone numbers because you really don't want the person to have to think when they're in a crisis. <clears throat> because remember when you're in a crisis, your prefrontal cortex goes offline and you're not thinking very clearly. So you wanna have everything really spelled out there. Um, so if the distraction doesn't work, then you're gonna to go to the people on your support team and you're gonna say, I'm, I've tried using my safety plan and I'm still feeling really unsafe. Can you be with me? And can you help me figure out what the next steps are? And if that person is not able to de-escalate that's when you go to step five, and that's when you reach out to the clinicians, the agencies, the local emergency department, um, the suicide prevention crisis text line or hotline. 
to walk through the next steps. Um, and then step six, you're going to talk with them about when you are acutely suicidal, when you're at the top of that bell curve, um, how can we make the environment safe? What are some things in your environment that we don't want you to have access to. So you are going to specifically ask about guns. Um, this doesn't mean you're going to say to your um, hunter in West Virginia that you can never hunt again. But what you are going to say is when you are acutely suicidal, it's not safe for you to have easy access to those guns because your prefrontal cortex has gone offline and you're not thinking clearly. So we want to remove access. Um, pills, things of that nature. Any questions so far? There were a couple questions in the chat. I don't know if you saw, um, but there was one person who asked about, not related to the safety planning though, so I don't know if you wanna stay focused on. Um, Christina, is that the one you're asking about? Um, any well, there was some, no, there was somebody who said, what if, what if a patient expresses a desire to commit suicide and has a plan, but real, realistically could not do it? Thank you. I did want to go back and, and speak to that. Thank you for bringing that up. Um, who was the, per there they are, Amanda Gageby. Would you mind to give us a little bit more information, um, this person, how they could realistically realistically not harm themselves. I'm they sorry. Might, yeah, not be on the call anymore. I'm sorry. That was a really good question. Um, and I wanted to know more information, but with with no information, what I would say is um, I would still refer, even if that client did not have access to their plan, I would still refer because that is an indicator of exactly how awful they are feeling and that they need a higher level of care. A client who says, I have this plan and I'm going to act on this plan, if that plan is not available to them, there's a high likelihood that they're going to reach for another plan. Um, let's say they are physically unable to use that plan. They still are feeling so bad that they want to die and they could benefit from some more intensive care. So hopefully that answers the question for other folks on the call today. All right, thank you. Let's go to the next slide. I always run out of time on these things. Okay, so here's a graphic of the suicide risk curve. Um, so it's important for you to understand it and for you to explain it to your clients. This is like empowerment for the suicidal client because when they understand that even though you feel this way now, you are not always gonna feel this way. When they understand that, it's like so empowering because they know what to do to help themselves. And that's always our goal, right? We wanna help our clients learn how to help themselves. So you're gonna let them know that people at risk for suicide are likely to experience changes in their level of risk over time. Acute suicide risk usually increases and then decreases over a short period of time. And the goal of safety planning is for people to become more aware of their personal warning signs um, so that they can take action. So you're just going to re remind them it's important to know what your personal warning signs are when you're at the top of the curve and you're really high at risk. We're going to do everything we can to keep you safe. And then that risk is going to go down over time because we're using your safety plan. We're keeping you safe. Uh, that wizard brain is coming back online and we're going to, you know, keep moving forward. Okay, so I think I'm going to skip the videos because we only have about five minutes left, but when you get the PowerPoint, you'll have access to those videos. So there are some on the um, Stanley Brown website and there are some on the Columbia Lighthouse website. Uh, the Lighthouse Project website, and so many on YouTube. If you have questions about like, how do I talk about it? Or um, 
what do I say next? What does it really look like in practice? There are so many videos online that you can watch. Um, that was super fast. Does anybody have any questions that we didn't answer so far? I have just, and I don't know how much time you have to go into this, but um, can you talk a little bit about how the sort of risk assessment piece falls in? Because the Columbia is like the brief one that you showed is just sort of the brief initial screener, right? And so it's not a thorough risk assessment. And, and can you talk a little bit about how that step fits in between into this and? and yeah, uh, thank you. Um, so what you might do, let's see. I'm gonna change my view. What am I doing here? Okay, so you might do a short screen like this. Um, and this might indicate that the client is a little bit more at risk than what you are aware of. So then you might do a longer screener. Um, I like to use the safety protocol. It's four pages long. And within the safety protocol, it includes um, presenting symptoms, family history of suicide, precipitants or stressors. Uh, so it talks about triggering events like humiliation, shame, chronic pain, physical or sexual abuse, um, pending incarceration or homelessness, change in treatment like uh, your therapist left the agency or your doctor retired. Um, and then it helps you go through protective factors. So um, want to stay alive for the kids, strong faith system, um, fear of death or reasons for living. Um, and then it asks you specific questions such as how many times a week have you had these thoughts? Um, when you have these thoughts, how long do they last? Can you stop yourself from thinking about these thoughts? Um, is there anything that would deter you from acting on these thoughts? Um, and then there's a place for you to make notes at the bottom, such as um, preparatory acts that they might have started to do, um, any aborted attempts or interrupted attempts, any actual attempts. Um, and then there's a place here where it prompts you to consider if you're working with a youth, bringing the parents in and discussing with them what's going on. And then the final step, I, this is black and white, so I didn't use colored ink, but um, this gives you a more detailed um, explanation of low risk, moderate risk, high risk, what to do next. So at the very top, what you're gonna do is you're gonna observe them, you're gonna put them on elopement precautions, um, you're going to involve their family or significant other, and you're going to create a safety plan, so on and so forth. Does that answer your question, Dr. Christensen? Yeah, yeah, I think I just wanted, you know, to sort of see how that piece fit in, so thank you. Yeah, I wish that I had more time to talk about that. So I think when I send you the new slides, I'll put this in there too. Okay, thank you. Yeah, and we can always have you come back <laughs> if you want. Um, if so, I can uh, get my uh, technology together. Okay. Um, so I, we are going to have to stop because we're right at one o'clock, but I, I really appreciate you coming in and, and presenting on this, this really important topic. And um, I want to thank all of our participants who are here. And um, it, it, please take a moment if you haven't already to fill out the evaluation survey and um, stay tuned. We will be sending out announcements for our fall lunch and learn seminar series um, probably fairly soon since it seems like we're, we're pretty much full up already, which is great. So um, thank you, everyone, and I hope you all have a good day. And thank you, Beth, for your okay. for your great presentation. Thank you.